Uh, this happened. This happened in Chico. Uh, quite unusually, I thought. Uh, the pastor is just coming off his paternity leave this week. And so he wrote a note to the uh, visiting pastor who's preaching today, telling him, don't do Reformation Day, because uh, it just gives Lutherans another opportunity for self-congratulation. And uh, they're already proud enough of themselves, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they should be doing this. And I just hit the, they're both having very good friends of mine. And uh, the, the pastor is guest preaching today. I'm going to go home in a little while and see what, whether he took the advice or not. Because I wrote a long letter about why he shouldn't take that advice. And I said, imagine in the monthly newsletter, so imagine this happened up here. Imagine Seth saying in this coming monthly newsletter, listen, I know a lot of you have birthdays coming up. I really would like to encourage you not to celebrate your birthdays <laughs> because it really is just another opportunity for self-congratulation. You know, get over it. Um, and I argued that to honor one of the most famous events in the Western tradition, uh, is not the same thing as patting yourself on the back. You could use it as an opportunity for self-correction or self-improvement. One of the uh, mottos of the uh, Protestant Reformation is semper reformanda est. The church must always be uh, in the process of being reformed. So why would you lose that opportunity? So uh, the first few minutes, I'm going to say how you could do it as Lutherans. There's no doubt that Lutherans could get it wrong. And in, a, in another book I wrote a while ago, I said that the, the doctrine of grace can suck all the oxygen off the stage so that there is no room for human action because human action might sound like you're doing it to to produce a good work that will get you into heaven and so to make sure that you don't do any good works to get you into heaven we just won't talk about the good works that lutherans or the christians might do which is a real dumb way to do it um, so I'm going to suggest, before I return to this sheet, several things that Lutherans could do. Um, and I was just telling George, I know that Marilyn and Phyllis and others have, uh, over the years, written the prayers of the church that are in that right, that, that are used on Sunday mornings. And here's a prayer, this comes from a Lutheran female theologian who I think died maybe a couple of decades ago, Dorothy Zulle, S-O-E-L-L-E. And she said that you could have a hermeneutic to, to resolve this Lutheran issue, this obsession that you might be accused of doing good works, that you can have a hermeneutic of results. So you can say, we have a doctrine of grace that is above all else, and how does that work its way out into results? And one of her suggestions, which I would make to those of you who write prayers to the church, and that I was just telling you, telling you, George, before we started, you could pray every single Sunday, God, give us the grace to see you in the poor. See, no good works there. You're actually letting God be the one who initiates this ability in your, in your Christian life to see, just as in Matthew 25. That's the question in Matthew 25. When did we see you? And Jesus sort of says, you know, get real. You, you should have allowed me to lead you to, to see you. 
So that's one thing. Uh, another thing, and this is somewhat recent, recent. Uh, in fact, I myself have only come across this in the last year. There's a, a book, um, I can't think of the guy's name right now, but he looks at uh, Luther and the way Luther crosses the barrier between church and state and gives a whole lot of information, a whole lot of, uh, not information, recommendations to the German princes. Now, of course, you can't really get back to the 16th century. The 16th century, of course, had a, a state church. And the Holy Roman Emperor was Christian Northern Europe. So it was taken for granted that everybody in Northern Europe was Christian, whether eventually they turned out to be Protestant or Catholic Christian. And so the German princes, the very people who saved Luther from being um, uh, subject to capital punishment after the Diet of Worms in 1521, the very people who saved Luther and hid him away were the kind of people that Luther never was slow to give advice to. It would be as if the way, what we accused, we were just talking, what we accused evangelicals of doing. They, they want, evangelicals were so proud of themselves that they had the White House on their speed dial. And they always knew that if they called uh, Trump, he would answer the phone, more or less, um, and that they could influence him. Well, this was Luther in the 16th century. So we have records now that Luther frequently was giving the German princes who were the rulers of, of those principalities, prime minister, you might say, giving them advice on how to have, um, like sometimes they call it a mercy chest or a public chest of, of uh, handouts, let's not use the word handouts, of uh, offerings for the poor. And uh, Luther didn't in the least hesitate. He didn't say to himself, oh, I can't tell them that because that would be a good work and then they might get that mixed up with grace. No, he didn't say that at all. He said both in his own parish church in Wittenberg and in all the churches that he could influence through the German princes, he recommended that the church and the state develop a, a very activist approach to assisting people who were in poverty or sick or whatever. So the so-called quietism that Lutherans are always accused of, I can't remember whether I told you this joke last Sunday, it's too good a joke, so I'll tell you. Okay. The, old, the old line that we used to say at seminary is that if the Puritans had been German Lutherans, we would still be a colony of England. And the idea is that Lutherans were very cautious about political activism. Because, uh, and this was the scars that Luther carried from the peasants' revolt. So in 1523, 24, 25, there is a peasant's revolt in which the peasants, they thought they were doing it in the name of the gospel. They took Luther seriously. If you could, if you could reform Rome, maybe you could reform the German principles and society. And so they rose up in a peasant's army to try to, uh, win about uh, appropriate welfare state, we might say, for the poor. It failed badly. For one thing, it brought the Reformation into disrepute because the princes that Luther was trying to win over were saying, wait a minute, is this what the Lutheran Reformation is about? Peasants wars? And the peasants were slaughtered by the tens of thousands. And Luther then was accused of having their blood on his hands. And so it was an absolute disaster in every way. 
and Luther, and this then led to centuries of Lutherans keeping their hands off radical, long before Marx, keeping their hands off of radical social reform because remember the peasants revolt. And uh, maybe we would say that Luther drew the wrong conclusion or that Lutherans, subsequent Lutherans drew the wrong conclusion, but whatever was, it was a disaster that gave Luther, unlike in uh, 17th century England, it's the Puritans who rise up and even bring about the death of the British king. Um, it was different from the French Revolution. The French Revolution never assassinated their king in the name of Christ, but the Puritans did do away with the monarchy, if only for about 11 years, uh, in the name of what they considered to be uh, a Christian calling. So um, that's that. That's my Lutheran pitch. Um, everything on page one, I feel like we have pretty well done. You have to get. Uh, we've pretty well done. So that's really an argument. Don't be a pessimist. Don't say to yourself, it would be very nice if uh, American Christianity really became known as Matthew 25 Christianity, but that's such a long shot and it almost certainly is not going to happen. And how often does radical change really happen in the history of Christianity? And the answer should have been continuously. There is always something so from Jesus, of course, to St. Paul, to St. Augustine, to monasticism, to Thomas Aquinas, to uh, Tyndale and Wycliffe. And, and some of these people became martyrs um, to Luther, to Wesley, to, um, oh, and I forgot monasticism. So the, the record is a continuous record of individual people who see something new and start a movement and the movement either fails, often the case, or gains traction and uh, things begin to change. Uh, when I was at Berkeley, I, I think I mentioned last Sunday, we, were, uh, we had a big grant from the Ford Foundation and we were, uh, six of us doctoral students were doing studies of um, new religious movements in the Bay Area. And I was the one who did the Jesus movement, but the other people did non-Christian movements. And uh, two years ago, 50 years later, uh, I became aware, they, I mean, they wrote me and invited me uh, Jesus Movement leaders were gathering in Berkeley for their 50th anniversary, <laughs> and they and they evolved in every imaginable way. Some of them became Greek Orthodox bishops. Mm. What these guitar playing people in from the beach became Greek Orthodox bishops, especially Lutherans. Yeah, and others became. Um, they revolutionized, so just what we cutely say, guitar worship, they revolutionized the way uh, liturgy and worship was conducted. And um, I don't think most of them would want to take any credit for the move to the Christian right, but they would take credit for the fact that American evangelicalism became different from what it had been in part as a result of the Jesus movement in California. Both in, in South, I was only studying in Berkeley in the Bay Area, but in Southern California, uh, those churches, which today are million people churches, um, all stemmed from the new movement that began in that time. And uh, the conclusion that those of us who were studying them through is that if you read the times right and you ask yourself what the times demand, you can bring about radical social change. 
because the change will be congruent with what the times demand. Uh, Eric, Eric Erickson, uh, not a Christian that I know about, wrote a famous book. He, he was kind of a psychological anthropologist and historian, I guess. He wrote a book called The Young Man Luther, and uh, it was widely criticized because he didn't always get Luther right, and, and he really wasn't a Luther scholar. But his most famous statement in the book is that in relieving his own religious angst, he solved the problems of his age. I love that. And I have quoted that in so many classes and in my upcoming book, again, that he thought he was solving his own religious anxiety about being good enough for God. And in the process, he shifted what Europe, North European Christianity looked like. He didn't set out to do that. It was an accident. It was something that happened. Who, 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 who saw it coming? So now I'm going to jump ahead to um, what is sometimes called a Bonhoeffer moment. Um, That would be a moral moment, although you could call it a theological moment. So Bonhoeffer was, Matthew was, Mark, was Bonhoeffer's favorite gospel, I think you could say. And as a result of his uh, studying of Matthew, he wrote one of his most famous books, The Cost of Discipleship. And there he did take on Lutheranism. He didn't say Luther got grace wrong. He said Lutherans misuse grace. And his famous line was, his famous expression was cheap grace. So cheap grace, as he famously said, is grace without a cross, grace without discipleship, grace without obedience, grace without following Christ, grace as just a free ticket to heaven. And uh, that had a tremendous influence on uh, German Lutheranism and Protestantism, and maybe Catholicism as well. And um, out of that experience that Bonhoeffer was experiencing, there came his rising up to protest Hitler. And so these famous German words, die bekennende Kirche, the confessing church, and the Fahrer Note Bund, the pastor's emergency league. Just think of that. Can you imagine the within the ELCA? Okay, I guess we could imagine. It. Can you imagine within the ELCA there would emerge the pastor's emergency league, and what that would mean? Presumably, is league. Uh, the German, the word German word is nicer. Bund. Uh, Bund is a is a a group of people coming together for some expressive social purpose. So imagine the ELCA having a pastor's emergency league to whatever, respond to the conditions of the age. Well, maybe they should if they haven't. Say again. Maybe they should if they haven't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe they could. Um, and if we were to have, as we were sort of dreaming last Sunday, that Matthew 25 Christianity could become a thing, I mean, just who would have guessed? I can remember when uh, this church became a reconciling in Christ church, and at least two families that I knew well left. Felt they had to leave because they could. And, and uh, the current president of our congregation left the Presbyterian Church at Chapel Hill because that Presbyterian Church 
decided that Christianity required that they be anti gay. And so they left. Uh, and now he's the president of our congregation. Nice to get up there. Uh, but uh, a lot of does anybody know the percentage of ELCA churches that are reconciling at Christ? Pro LGBTQ. Yeah, I'm not sure we could find out if we could look at the local ELCA office. But no one could have predicted that that was the case. And I think I mentioned last Sunday the I, I belong for old times sake to a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, Facebook group with hundreds and hundreds of Missouri Synod clergy and laity in it. And they love to point to the ELCA as having left historic Lutheranism and become pro-gay. So they pat themselves on the back, you know, there with the grace go by. They pat themselves on the back and they are sure that um, the ELCA has really pretty much lost, lost its way. Uh, and yet, look at us, we don't seem like we have lost our way on this issue, for example. And a classic Lutheran question is when you're confronted with a major thing that comes to you, how is the gospel at stake? How is the gospel at stake? So let's say we're 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and uh, a couple uh, gay people or bisexual people or whatever uh, come to this church and they say, we'd like to join this church. And the pastor calls an emergency meeting of the church council like, is this going to be okay or not? We'd love to think, and maybe this is the way it happened, we'd love to think that some member of the council, or maybe the pastor herself in those days, said, how is the gospel at stake? If Christ is the means through which God shows his grace, to the human condition and welcomes us into his family, if that's the gospel, how would welcoming a gay person into our community put that gospel at stake? That's the Lutheran way of asking the question. Not have we always been anti-gay or have we always assumed that God's people are permanently marked between the binary of male and female. And if that's the case, where, where is that in the gospel? It's true, the Old, the Old Testament certainly talks about people in as male and female. But uh, if, if, if you're coming at it from Galatians and Romans or the Gospel of John, how would the gospel be at stake if you accepted gay people into your community? And the, you can't come up with an answer. And so not being able to come up with an answer, we crossed that threshold, I think, to our great credit, as have, as have so many others. And even the poor Pope is, um, who's now a picture smiling with, have you seen on Facebook, when Trump and his wife and Ivanka were in Rome, they're sitting like this, and the Pope is standing there like this. <laughs> and then there's the current picture where uh, Biden is there and the Pope is standing there like this, like something has shifted. So the Pope is struggling um, with how can we allow creative evolution happen in the Catholic Church that is contrary to our historic traditions, but which might be God please. See, Catholics wouldn't have a problem with becoming a Matthew 25 church. It's in their bloodstream. 
Um, if you go to uh, European museums where, where the walls are loaded with Christian art and what is called the material culture of medieval Christianity, picture after picture after picture in every city that you go into, from Berlin to Paris to whatever Amsterdam, you see medieval pictures in which Matthew 25 is being acted out. So in one part of the picture, there's a small group of monks who are running a hospital and welcoming the sick in. And in another part of the, I mean, these are beautiful pictures. In another part, there are a small group of Christians uh, serving food to people who don't have any. And in another one, there's a group of people who have some kind of a hostel that they develop to bring in people without uh, a place to stay. So that's going back 12, 13, 14th century. So it's not a baby for Catholics. And isn't that interesting how different, nor is it for Wesleyanism. Remember, it's out of Wesleyanism that the Salvation Army is born. They're Wesleyan. Uh, so different religion, different Christian traditions can have different things that come natural to them. And maybe we would say theology comes natural to Lutherans. And even a lot of Protestants say, well, if you really want a good theological education, you know, you want to go to Germany. Uh, if you want a PhD, that's what I thought. If you want a PhD in biblical studies, you, you really, Germany's where it's happening. Now that's less true today than it was once. But different religious, different Christian traditions can be unusually strong at different times in any different ways. So you wouldn't probably say that Matthew 25 is a historic strength of Lutheranism, all the more so that, and to return to Maryland and people who write prayers in the church, once they started showing up, just, just like this, uh, this uh, recruitment thing that I read to you from the Christian Century last week, a church in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, uh, was a pastor, and they want the pastor to know ahead of time that they're a Matthew 25 church, and they're also an environment. Uh, climate, climate worry church. So if, 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 if you can't talk that language, we would be the right church for you to come to. So what if we gradually turned ourselves into that church? So now what could take the pivot? Here's what I'm going to suggest. When Bonhoeffer, and Bonhoeffer isn't actually the founder of the Confessing Church, was Father Karl Barth, but Bonhoeffer was, was, they were buddies, and Bonhoeffer was a little bit of a Protestant Calvinist, but they were buddies, and uh, Hitler chased Barth home to Switzerland, and so that's where Barth was for the, for the war. Um, they became convinced that, that the church, looking out at society, can perceive such a crisis that they have to speak out. And this is called status confessing illness. We have reached a point where what we believe, teach, and confess, that's the, that's the famous slogan, we believe, teach, and confess, and I'll lose my way of saying it, we believe, teach, and confess, uh, we, we gotta come out on this issue. And, and maybe we did on gays. We believe, teach, and confess that your gender affiliation is not what uh, Christ is looking for when he shows his love to you. Now, what if today we said, we believe, teach, and confess that this country is in such a state, not to be too political, but this could be the period from Reagan to Trump, not Eisenhower. Eisenhower had a taxation rate that 
isn't a single liberal Democrat who is here called Zoe. It's like 80 percent attacks uh, on on uh, the extremely wealthy. So what have you said? It is a disaster. Yeah, I don't. I haven't heard sermons like this. Not picking up set that room that she go either. I haven't heard sermons where people are saying, "What is going on in this society?" And maybe as Lutherans, we might even say, "Look at Sweden and Norway and Germany and Denmark." They look like they've been reading Matthew 25 just last week because they are packed with social programs for the good of all. And uh, it might be that it has nothing to do with Lutheranism. There's an argument going on in the literature that this could, it could mostly be part of the church anymore. So it can happen. That there can be a powerful Lutheran legacy long after Lutherans have quit showing up for church. Okay, we're sorry about that, but that can be true. But yeah. Well, there is a, a pretty strong tradition of uh, the Lutheran Church as a social statement, uh, which, you know, the social statements on, on uh, abortion, on creation care, on integration. Yeah. That are a whole lengthy process for those to be adopted, and when they are adopted by the national yeah, that's church. True. I mean, I think that's really important that the Lutherans have had, at least in the last maybe 25 years, a pretty strong social gospel kind of thing. That's right, that's right. I came across, I think I sent this to George a couple of months ago. I came, and maybe all the other clergy here. Know this, but it was new to me. The ELCA has like an ordination pledge, which every new pastor pledges to. And I, I don't have it in my head right now, but he pledges that his ministry her. Or, or her, right? Good point. Wow. That they're got to get our pronouns straight. That their ministry will be about seeking out the lost and the this and the that and lifting them up to God in their ministry. It's the kind of statement Wesley could have made. He was really on his game. It stunned me that it's an ELCA ordination statement. Um, well, you and I did not say no, we didn't. when we were ordained no. 60 years ago. Of course, I was in Missouri Senate, so for sure I didn't say that. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it's, so then are we, you know, it's the old line, practicing what we preach. Are we practicing what we preach? It's probably a good sign if you say, well, let's just go, let's go to Chicago and check out all of the public official statements of the ELCA about the kind of society in which we live and what we should be doing about it. And uh, maybe we would say, wow, we are really radical. We are Matthew 25. You might not see the word Matthew 25, uh, at least in my experience. They haven't said all of the Southwest, as I said last time, the Southwest California said of the LA people, LA San Diego, they're using Matthew 25. Any really terrific thing they're doing, they call it the Matthew 25 project. See, that's the way you win these battles. If you're doing something good, smack a label of Matthew 25 on it, and people start to see, oh yeah, that goes together, doesn't it? So maybe we are, maybe we could be. Or are, or are on the way to be a Matthew 25 church. Because when we do these things, and people say, oh, yeah, that's Matthew 25. Well, that's a good way of thinking because Matthew 25 happens to be in the Bible. It's, nobody can say, oh, is this cultural Marxism, which is what evangelicals say. This is cultural Marxism. 
Uh, and if you want to reform society, that has nothing to do with Christianity. That's, that's Marx. Um, never mind that they hope to reform society through President Trump and so forth. So there's there's that. But not all evangelicals were were Trumpsters. Um, but you see that there could be these statements that are so like, what are we doing? Could we uh, put them in the bulletin every Sunday? Um, there's this line that I picked up from Facebook. Uh, when dealing with the crisis of your age, don't build the wall higher, build your table longer. It's a nice, <laughs> cute. It, it's cute, but it, it, that is a 1925 statement. Don't build the wall higher, build your table longer. That's, that's a 1925 statement. And you could even carve it into the table, maybe. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on out there that you could say, these are what the times call for. Uh, the, the other, in, in our lifetime, the other uh, moment that was called the status confessionis moment was when uh, South African apartheid came to an end. And um, when Christians around the world, and not just in South Africa, they actually had the around the poor record. Those Dutch Calvinists in South Africa were pretty cool with blacks being subjugated. So it didn't necessarily come from them, but it was foisted on them. And Christians around around the world said, "How could you? What could you possibly be doing?" And some of the great people that came out of South Africa were the, the leaders. They weren't clergy, but they were Christians. And so the thing came: how how can you look around South Africa, which is just as bad as it can be, and call yourself a Christian? This is time to speak out. Okay, so this is Bonhoeffer in the moment, uh, and Karl Barth said, uh, if Hitler is saying, I have a new revelation of German peoplehood, uh, Barth and Bonhoeffer came along and said, there is only one source of new revelation that Christians recognize. The Bible. So show me, show me where. Now, um, so we could be, I guess I want to conclude this part of saying, could we, so I don't mean, so, so Seth was not here this morning as he was last Sunday, but those of you who, who write the prayers of the people, and those of you who influence what kinds of sermons are preached, does does Army Day still have a meeting each week in which members of the congregation and the pastor get together to talk about the texts? Yeah, the texts that are going to be preached the, the following Sunday. So that becomes an ideal moment for the pastor and the people can come together and they're all carrying with them the cares of the age and their observations and what needs to be said, what status confessionis moment there is, and what kind of belief, teaching, confess do we need to hear about in our Sunday worship. And um, so today, Jeremiah, I, I saw something on Facebook yesterday, some forlorn Luther who said, are there any pericopes that we use on Reformation Day? Duh! Uh, uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, uh, the New Covenant from Jeremiah and John 8, uh, the truth shall make you free. Those are historic Old Testament and Gospel lessons for Reformation Day. I don't know how Luther, Luther maybe it was a pastor, how uh, Luther would, would know that. So now let me, in this let me see if anybody wants to jump in and say anything. And then, otherwise, I'm going to move to uh, the bottom of the second page. I would just say that this whole conversation 
has to do with the uh, shifting of, of our understanding of the gospel yes. from being an excessively personalistic yes. me and Jesus gospel yes. to a corporate gospel exactly. to a gospel of the world. So I think this is an interesting shift that's happening within the Lutheran church as well as uh -huh. the church at large. But it's not happening with the evangelicals. Not happening. It's not happening with the evangelical churches. It's all about no, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. No. And I was wondering about the other um, Lutheran groups, because there's still a large group of people from the Midwest that split off from the ELCA. What's their take on this? And also um, some of the other groups, do they embrace it at all? Yeah. Uh, Lyle, I know, or, or Daryl. So, some one thing you can do if you can't stand the ELCA is you can join the Missouri Seminary. That isn't usually what happens, though. But weren't there small groups that split off from the ELCA? And weren't they called themselves? Well, what it called uh, Lutheran Churches and Mission for Christ, oh. LCMC. And uh, another was uh, there are a couple of other groups. Uh, uh, the uh, free Lutheran church tradition uh, that's still alive and well. And so, yeah, there's, there are small, yeah. smaller church bodies. The group that split off from the ELCA for the most part became, um, what's, what is their name? Association of Free Lutheran Churches. Yeah. AALC. AAL, yeah, FLC. Anyway, yeah, we have a different church. That happens when you've got a major shift in Christianity. There are people who don't like the major shift, so they start yeah. another shift. <laughs> yeah, and you always put free in the title. Oh, yeah. Because you, you want to emphasize that you are not going to be. And most of, these, most of these church bodies also, by the way, are very congregational. Yes. Meaning that's that. right. Maybe you can be free for many staff coming out of Chicago. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that the congregation makes its own decisions as it regards everything. Let me uh, just, uh, uh, please. I think there's a, there's a real danger in every reformation focus. Uh, and that's the idea that I got it right now. You got it wrong. Yeah. And it's like, you have to do yeah. So the other issue then is is our natural tendency to discriminate yeah. against those who are and 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 uh, evil that the yeah. uh, and 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 they get at the most violent point when we disregard the Jesus statement love your enemy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good point. And I'm sure the pastor in Chico, I'm going to have great respect for him. Maybe what he really meant was, if this is, I got it right now Sunday, don't do it. <laughs> this is not, I got it right now on Sunday. Uh, okay, let me just, uh, you can take this home, so if we don't make this through. Taking five big steps. So one we talked about, small groups of people, people who write the prayers of the people, People who are in the uh, ELCA, Southern California district, people yeah. here, people there, uh, they're starting to use this lingo and it's starting to get catchy. Uh, people sort of rediscover that Matthew is actually a discipleship bag. So if you want to know how Christians should behave, keep reading Matthew over and over until you've got it well chewed into your system. Three, could it ever, God forbid, could it ever be the case that Matthew 25 could be as important a slogan as John 3.16? When it is, you'll know we've, we've, we've come, come to Jesus and uh, millions of Americans are saying, what's that sign there, that football game? Matthew 25? Oh yeah, I know that. I saw that on Facebook last week. So that would happen. The World Series game yesterday we had Sign John 3.16, but there was no Matthew 25. Yeah, right. All right, so we got to get this at the next World Series. Um, by the way, I read that the reason the Atlanta Braves have been so successful 
Is it they have dairy creams? Uh, they introduce dairy creams, soft ice cream in their clubhouse. And whenever they're not in the field, they're eating soft ice cream. And it's just tremendously kept up. <laughs> so, would you maybe consider that as the uh, very cool? Uh, number four, um, this, this mark of the church language. Uh, when Wesley, there's something called the Wesleyan Manifesto. There's a debate about did Wesley actually say this, or is it just Wesleyanism? But there's something called the Wesleyan Manifesto. It's straight Matthew 25, except maybe even more elaborate. And so if you're a Wesleyan, then this is the kind of stuff you're in. It just goes with it. Now, could we say that you can always tell Lutherans they are out there working for the poor and the hungry and the houseless? They're out there. That's the way you can tell Lutherans. See, we're not there yet. But that would be uh, a nice place to come to. And then five, uh, this is going to have to be George's topic if we go back to this in the spring. Could you really get to the point where you would say it's never enough to have Sunday worships and Bible study and sermons and prayers of the church saturated with Matthew 25? And it's never enough if people in Gate Harbor drive by and they see people praying with Matthew 25 signs. That's good, but that's not enough. Uh, when is it going to happen that we start making alliances, including with people who are Christians, or with people at Tacoma Community College, or you don't Tacoma, or, or, or whatever. Uh, you start making alliances with people like this, uh, Biden, the, the people's camp, the, um, the poor people's campaign on the day of the inauguration made a point of being in touch with Biden. Now, it could be that Biden, as a devout Catholic, kind of speaks that language anyway. The language of the poor, the language of labor unions, that's all Catholic language. It isn't Catholics who put unions out of business in the South. It's evangelicals. And so the Poor People's Campaign, or the so called Moral Mondays group, what I like about Moral Mondays is you don't just get to be a Christian on Sunday, then on Monday you march on the White House or on Congress, more likely Congress. So these are five things. And let me just close with this one. I never do this until I read up on Martin Luther King this past summer and fall. King spoke the language of alliance with the state. I never knew that. I knew that he was a spokesman for the Black Church and that he brought the plight of Blacks in a white racist society to public attention in a way that maybe helped white people feel guilty or want to reform. But I went back and when I read his speeches, he's always quoting the founding fathers. He's always quoting, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And so he's saying, don't think that this is just the black church kind of quirky thing because we're kind of an oppressed group. Don't even just think it's the white church. It's Christianity throwing its full influence on the state. And I'll close with this. The title of my book was going to be Matthew 25 Christianity, Redeeming Church and Country. My editor had a heart attack and he wrote back and said, you can't say that. How can we liberals constantly be complaining about right-wing Christian right evangelicals and now the title of your liberal book book is redeeming the country. We can't touch that language because the Christian right has commandeered. So come up with something else. 
I said, how about renaming church to society? Perfect. Society is a neutral word. But I didn't happily give it up. I mean, I knew what I was doing. I wanted on purpose to be saying, because I had recently read the stuff on Luther with the German princes, that Christians who are citizens, which is more interesting, Christians who are citizens vote. And don't they exercise their vote in a smart, caring, shrewd, uh, far-sighted way. And if we can remember the New Deal of FTR or the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson, and we are nowhere even close to those, if we can remember that, why couldn't we say, if you're not talking that language, you're not going to get my vote? Why would that be bad? Uh, nevertheless, it's such a touchy thing when Christians show me up with the state because everybody assumes you mean Reagan and Trump. And so we have to ask ourselves, I guess, whether that language is now as it was for Luther. Luther, as soon as Luther heard radical reform, he got the peasants rebelling. Tens of thousands of peasants dead, the Luther Reformation discredited. That's what he always thought when he heard rebelling. So we have to ask ourselves, is the, is, the, is the word nation or the word state so discredited we can't use it? And yet most of the left wing of the country in, in Congress at the White House are Christians, Catholics often, and AOC, um, and Biden. So they're, they're willing to speak that language. And my last statement, when Paul Ryan was still the Speaker of the House, the faculty at Georgetown called him up for a dinner. And they said, we hear that you are an Anne Rand freak, that you carry Anne Rand's book around with you and you make all your staff read it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's me, that's me. And then they said, don't you realize that Anne Rand's libertarianism is incompatible with everything that's true about Catholic Christianity. You don't belong in this group if you're a libertarian. You just don't belong. Well, they didn't convert it, but he did get voted out of office. Oh, he said, yeah, he's not turned into me. Let me put it back. Okay, nice being with you. Thank and, you. Um,